All right. Welcome everyone to get the net. It's our first live version. So you might have to pain with us a little bit as we kick along and get all the bugs out. I've never tried this before. It's uh it's a new deal here, but we got Bassmaster College Bracket Champion from 2022, Lou Minetti. He stayed with us down at the last couple opens. Um he's the kind of guy you're, you know, immediately drawn to as a, as a fan of the sport. He's yeah, I don't know if you noticed last year, but he won in a 1997 Ranger boat. Seats looked like they got shredded by a damn mongoose. No graphs, no scoping, going up against uh, all the money in the world. And he had won the the college bracket, went to the Bassmaster Classic, made the cut there, uh, and then won the kind of live in the dream package. So he's been on the Opens all year this year. Uh, so we're going to hop into that. We're going to talk about the Opens. We're going to talk about the new schedule. We're going to talk about the Bassmaster College bracket that's currently underway right now. Lots of good stuff. Um, fire away with your questions. We've never had to get the net where uh, we've got the ability to to field questions. So uh, don't be shy there. Uh, it's probably going to be about 20 minutes till Louie hops on here. So fire away for the questions. It might get a little bit awkward with just me sitting here in the corner of the garage. but. Uh, before we get rolling here, big shout out to 13 Fishing. I don't know if you missed the sale. There was just a, a good one at Lake of the Woods Sports Med as we're buy two, get the third free. Absolute beauty weapons. They don't cost you a fortune, which is kind of going to be the crux of the show. Um, so check those out. I think the sale's done now, but keep an eye out for the fall sales at Lake of the Woods Sports on 13 poles. Nordic Point Lodge. I don't know if you've seen the video from heading up there yet, but it's pretty much the northern limit for where smallmouth can go. I got some glide bait warm up for Lake of the Ozarks out there. Uh, check that video out and check out their information in the description below. Once I piece this beauty together, I don't know how it works with tagging and, and titles. Like I said, this is the first live ever. I talked to Lou 20 minutes ago. We said we're going to crank her up. So uh like i said bear with me and if you haven't checked out the dried and tag fish contest you got to get your ass over to wabagoon lake that place is as good as she gets i'm dying sitting here you know i got no boat no ability to go there right now but as soon as the ice glades is over i'll be sliding over there um you know drop the skidoo on her and go hunt down some crappies check out that tag fish contest win yourself a few bucks you got a better chance making money there than any fishing tournaments as we're uh as we're learning over the year here but um yeah bt fishing i mentioned this on the last couple podcasts uh we want to give all the get the netters a, a 10 percent deal so all our inventories moved over to lake of the woods sports sportsheadquarters.ca whether you're us or canadian or zimbabwe or wherever use promo code get the net all caps on any bt fishing item smelt naders crusher jig marabou jig all that stuff uh, clean jig clack shots and you'll get 10 points in the card at checkout definitely worth a look there and we're going to touch on the local derby scene here i just watched whitefish bay live wrap up today um that's a 34 boater out of whitefish bay ontario to us and arvel put it on and there's a lot of people that really help out there uh I'll have to check the names, but really good derby uh, buddies, Brian Gustafson and Jay Samsel just won that um, was, was exciting to watch. I had to build a deck all weekends. My first weekend, well, my only weekend in between, I had those two back-to-back -back opens and I'm heading back down to Florida on Thursday morning. Um, so I had some responsibilities. I can't be hopping in derbies with no boats or anything like that, but they had a, a big day to come back and won. And that's actually Samsel's second win in a row in Sioux Arrows. Um, so the, him and Scott Dingwall won Bass for Bucks, which we haven't covered yet. That's a big 120, I think 125 boat tournament, a three day out of Sioux Arrows, Ontario. One of my favorite tournaments, definitely worth checking out there. Uh, just after that, Shoal Lake Fall Derby, Buddy Gussie gets her done, beating up on everyone at home. Um, it's not easy to win any of these fall derbies, though. Like, you know, there's a, there's a handful of really hardcore anglers and everyone posts big weight. So, um, congrats to Gussie on that one, him and Dennis Favreau. And then another small fall derby, LaBelle's fall classic, Jeff Bragg and Ross Steele litter up. That's a three fish derby and they had like 13 something for small malls. So pretty dialed in there. Congratulations, boys. Crow Lake classic. And there's a lot of derbies around here. Like you can, you can vaporize your fall in a hurry. It's uh it's a long winter. 
and uh, everyone likes hopping in these derbies and um you know we know what's coming it's sitting on a bucket for the next six months so um tons of derbies around but crow lake congratulations to ben gustason and ali crandall um first place his dad and his brother-in-law uh got second place and i don't have the stats in front of me but i know gusty and shelby got fourth in that one too so it was a bit of a gustason showdown down at the crow lake um looks like a real cool place i haven't been fishing there but looks pretty badass i think we're caught up for a bit uh the frank mcclymont is next weekend that's the last derby of the year uh i miss fishing that one i missed it last year um you know fished it the years past and it usually takes over 20 pounds to win it's a one day or it's probably one of the bigger fall derbies they're usually over 50 boats so it's uh it's coming up and gonna have eyes on that one even from the road um so i just i haven't done a podcast i like i have no time but we we're cranking this up because it's only going to take an hour and uh, i don't have to edit it or anything just hopefully louie or i don't say anything way off side that i have to take it down other than that we'll be good to go but um i've got enough practice on live podcasts that that's kind of uh that fear is a little bit gone but it is there and it is real but anyway um we just wrapped up uh back-to-back opens on the road first one at watts bar tennessee uh circled on the schedule as one of the toughest tournaments on the whole open schedule the nine tournament schedule we knew it was going to be tough going into it um it was tough (laughs) it was real tough it actually wasn't as hard as i thought it was going to be to get bit there um you know all these lakes are so foreign to me and and you know a handful of the other guys too uh that you just kind of go there drop your trolling motor try to pick a section of the lake and just treat it as a small lake and break it down because most of these places are 40 50 miles long and um you know i i thought i could do okay like it's one of those lakes it's actually not that bad um but there's a 15 inch minimum on largemouth and a 18 inch minimum on smallmouth and there's actually quite a few smallmouth in it um so i mean I, I i knew if i just caught a limit i was an eighth in overall aoi points heading into it and right now the top 10 go to the elite series so there's three tournaments left when i headed into that thing with eight so i was like i'll just catch a, a limit each day and you know that's obviously easier said than done uh s- s- kind of survive that one and just not get way out of it in points well day one came and it was not going my way i uh I actually got food poisoning the night before the tournament. This is not an excuse at all because I still would have caught what I caught. I just, it was just like salt in the wounds for, for how bad the weekend went for me, but didn't sleep at all. Uh, had a short day the first day. Uh, so if you're in one of those first flights, you're only fishing like seven to three where the guy in the last flight's fishing like seven, 10 to, to five, which is what I got the next day. So it always adds a little bit more panic to the first day. The first one's always the scariest one for me because you really don't know where your first bite's coming from on any of these places. I don't care how good they are or how bad they are. Um, but went out, ran a bunch of stuff, caught a pile of shorts, 14 and 7 eighths, 14 and 3 quarters, throwing them back, throwing them back. A couple like 16 and 3 quarter inch small malt that weighed like two and a half pounds. I still didn't have a bass at 12 o'clock. I had to be you know, I was 40 minutes away and I had to be in at three and I'm throwing back two and a half pound small malts, just losing my mind. Um, but eventually picked up the chatterbait and just grinded her out and somehow caught three bass. One was actually a keeper small malt, um, which I mean, really did save my season. So came in, had my six pounds, was like in 90th and the, you know, these fields are like 200 boats. So um, I think there was like 190 at this one. So it was mid pack next day uh had a long day and i don't i i think if i could have fished for 16 hours i still wouldn't have caught a limit i was just sucking making the wrong calls on the wrong side of every short bass uh i had to be in at five and at three o'clock i had zero bass and if you follow me you'll know that i you know i keep track of of everything i catch i put it into bass track i know there's a lot of people at home i've spent lots of time in the office checking buddies bass track in the opens or the elites and if they don't update it, I get, you know, a little pissy. So 
Um, I, you know, I, I recognize everyone at home's watching and wants to see what's going on. So I always take the little bit of time to put it in. And if you were watching that day, you wouldn't have seen one until three 30. So I, I ended up catching two. My co-angler caught a four, eight, like the biggest bass of the tournament on the co-angler side. Um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that's was just the capper to the weekend. He was a really good guy and it's not like he cutthroat cast me or anything. I actually got down there and helped him land it. Um, he was leaning back on a butt seat and had, had her stretched over and it came up and jumped and he wasn't really looking at it that close. And I was like, yeah, might want to hand with that one. And he let me go down and grab it. So I at least got to touch a big one that weekend, but I had like, I don't know, I had two keepers a second day. I don't remember if it was three or four pounds, not good. Had 10 something over two days, um, finished 122nd. I thought that was the end of my season. Like 122nd is a super bomb. Uh, I already had the biggest bomb in the whole top 10 at 104th uh, at the first tournament and had battled back from then. And then I dropped this absolute nuke on Watts bar and I was like, okay, that's it for this one. I fell down to 20th in points. There's a ton of separation, you know, just really wasn't looking good. Like you get Ronnie Moore and the bass stats and everyone going through it. And they're like, yeah, it's pretty much, you're almost mathematically out uh need two top tens blah 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 and that's what i get for listening to doc talk so i I went into lake of the ozarks um you know same as everywhere else no info no idea never been there before caught some bass uh you know flipping in practice i I immediately started with the minner off the bank and i just wasn't feeling it i was catching some small keepers and a good one here and there but it's like the best flipping jig on floral lake i've ever been to in my life so i was just like i'm gonna have some fun if it works out i'll catch some big ones and uh you know she'll be all good and just kind of ran with that had no pressure just got to swing for it because i was so far back in points and ended up leading the tournament after two days uh which is crazy like i've got no business leading a dock skipping tournament after two days the first day i caught them all off like the backs of floats i was skipping a three quarter ounce jig and if you fish around here if you watch my dock fishing video on youtube you'll see me getting yelled at trying to learn how to skip docks because it's just not something we do here to compete you know you can go around coney island on lake of the woods and catch a bunch of two and a half pounders off docks but it's never a winning pattern around here except for maybe like a couple a couple little lakes around and i tried that and i got yelled at so um Anyway, just kind of a crazy thing. It's funny how, you know, things kind of work out. Um, And the last three, the last day of the last three of the Bassmaster Opens are all televised on Fox Sports and Bassmaster Live. So, um, you know, big, big ordeal had, uh, had Jake Latondris. Um, You'll recognize him from Mercer's podcast, Jake, Jake's takes. So. I uh, I got super lucky on a camera guy there. We had a good time. And once you make the top 10 in these tournaments, you can't fall any further than 10th. I think the lowest paycheck you can get is like 6,500 bucks US, which is like 2 million Canadian, I think right now. Um, so I was just like, we're going to have a, a fun day. I'm not going to panic around and worry about catching fish. And, you know, had fun with uh, Hackney and, and Ronnie Moore back in the studio. So I know how boring it can be to watch fishing. So kind of tried to do everything I could to lighten the mood up a little bit and just not freak out. So I ended up, uh, well, I got one punted at the tanks. <laughs> I had one that was a 15 inch line burner and it, uh, didn't quite make the grade by the time I got her up to the scale. So it got thrown back. I weighed like six, eight and got ninth place, which is fine. Um, so I went from 20th to back inside the top 10 in points. So in the elite series qualification, realm right now with one tournament left on the harris chain in florida um been getting lots of messages and calls and everything and lots of people want to know like what do you need to make it and i really don't know i'm kind of a stat nerd so i uh i usually have a a general idea but it's so hard to tell there's so many good anglers right behind me um mlf bpt world champion bobby lane is like a handful of points behind me millikan's uh like a couple points behind me it's all super tight it's going to come down to the harris chain and we really don't know what's going to happen um i'm not doing anything different to prepare for it like i bet you over half the field after lake of the ozarks or half the eq guys the guys fishing all nine 
probably went straight to Florida. I know a bunch of them that did, you know, just to, to get settled into Florida. It's confession can be totally different down there, I guess. So I'm told. Um, but the reality is I had to get my ass back up home and, you know, see my wife and my dog. And I, it, it, it was like a 20 day stretch on the road. So I wanted to come home anyway and had to build a deck this weekend, get everything winterized. Winter's coming. And, uh, I'm seeing all the pictures from, <laughs> from Florida. You're not allowed to actually fish the Harris chain yet, but you can, uh, you know, fish the surrounding lakes and get accustomed to it. But we're not going to do that. We're going to show up for our four and a half days of practice. And, um, it's going to be one of those deals. Like I would say, if I get a top 10, I'd be safe. Top 20, I'd have a chance, uh, a, a good chance. Top 30 questionable top 40, you'd need some bombs. So, um, you know, it's not like one, I have to go in and just maintain points and get 70th. I'm not treating it like that. That's kind of how I looked at Watts bar and it just didn't work out. So that's, uh, that's the update there. There's three guys that are already locked pretty much like if they catch a single bass, uh, JT Tompkins, John Garrett, and, uh, Trey McKinney, all super young guys. And actually it was pointed out Hackney and, and Suchon on live pointed out that I'm the oldest guy, um, in the EQ points race right now in the top 10, uh, Kenta Kamira is already qualified for the elites. He's a little older than me, but he doesn't count. They're looking at the ones that are qualifying and somehow 34 is, is the old goat in there. So it's kind of fishing's kind of gone away from, you know, it used to be like the 50 year olds kind of ran the show. And now there's, uh, there's a new wave and all they do is fish. Um, you know, I've, I've been able to, to just barely keep up as we go. Um, but I'm an old dog trying to learn new tricks is, is how this sport's kind of gone. Um, so <laughs> no complaints here, but Definitely, uh, definitely a lot more responsibilities than a lot of the field, um, you know, house stuff, camp stuff, everything like that, which is more than fine with me. And I'd never lean on it for an excuse or anything. Um, so I got some gray whiskers and, and, uh, trying to hang in there for the old dogs, I guess, I guess 34 is an old dog and fishing now, but, um, I'm going to be looking forward to that one. It's going to be televised on Fox sports one as well. Um, you know. Should be pretty fun. I actually went there once uh, with Gussie in 2012. It's the only lake I've been to on the whole schedule. We went for one day and uh, I don't know. <laughs> they spray the ga the grass and things change down there like crazy. So I'm uh, I'm going to go down there, splash the boat, try to isolate an area and, and go swinging for it. Either way, you know, no matter how the chips fall, it's still been an amazing season. I never expected to be sitting where I'm sitting, especially with only one small mouth tournament on the whole schedule. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard for a northerner, an old northerner to, uh, to compete, but you know, I'm, I'm proficient on the scope and I've been around the underhand game and chucking and winding and everything like that enough. And I'm nowhere near as good as, you know, these guys at like skipping a jig or, or, you know, anything like that. So, just barely surviving, pretty much running off heart and support from back home right now. I've had a lot of friends and and sponsors and everything that, you know, gave me the boost to be able to do this. So a lot of it is I really don't want to let them down or my family, wife, all everything like that. So it's uh it's gonna be interesting to see how it shakes out. Um and yeah, keep an eye out for the derby videos from Lake of the Ozarks and uh wherever else we were, Watts Bar. It's actually a nice lake, it's pretty. It's pretty. There's lots of grass. There's actually lots of bass. It just sucks for a tournament. But we'll uh, we'll check out some questions here. What do you do for a living? I work at a jail. Uh, pretty much been doing that since I was 19. Dan Ward says, "Wow, fishing has become a young man's sport," and it has. And uh, I don't know if you guys caught into the great wide opens with Randy Blokit. I I gotta say it better, Randy Blockit. I got in trouble for saying Blokit. By one of his fans, I, I got a, a few messages from some of his fans after the show, but he had, uh, during Lake of the Ozarks, he had made a thumbnail with my face on it, uh, you know, the entire top 10 from Lake of the Ozarks, and he just wrote on his thumbnail, what the heck has happened to professional bass fishing, and he gets into it and pretty much just calls us a bunch of spoiled rich kids with no responsibilities, and everyone's just a broke neck live scoper. Um, 
So I, I usually like to have positive vibes, you know, but I've been around the world long enough to know that uh, everything's not positive all the time. So we had him on there and I'll be honest, I hit him with some pretty tough questions. Um, Randy likes to talk a lot. As you you know, if you're on YouTube right now, you've guaranteed seen some of his videos. Huge anti-live scoper, uh, big advocate for lots of conservation, which I'm totally down with. I, I actually enjoy some of his videos. Uh, not his viewpoints very often, but um, Adam, <laughs> you just got to watch it. It's uh, it's something else. It's not the typical interview we do, but usually people don't make thumbnails with my face on them. And I, you know, I took kind of a little bit extra exception to it just because of how hard I've had to work my whole life, you know, to be able to afford a, a high end boat and all the rods and technology and everything you need to be able to compete in these. So, uh, major difference of opinions there uh both of us can be outspoken at times so check it out it was uh it was <laughs> it was interesting so lou's hopping on in a minute here i'm uh, gonna take a look and see what else we got to get into uh that college derby's happening right now easton father gill versus tucker smith for the college bracket championship we're gonna get into that with lou because he actually won it last year so um Hopefully he hops on. He just texted me. He was just about to blast his guy with a gel blaster. He said one of his buddies. So that's actually, those are sweet. This is uh, not a sponsor of the show, but they did. Uh, once you get big time on Instagram, like I am now, um, <laughs> that's what a crazy thing for a 34 year old to say. Um, these companies reach out and like, you know, I've got some cool stuff over the last year or two and, a couple were gel blasters and they're pretty much just like a way softened down version of a paintball gun, but they're like full auto and you can rip shit up pretty good with those. So they hurt enough. There's kind of like a mosquito bite or a bee sting or whatever, somewhere in, in between those. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Lou's going to shoot his buddy with one, I guess. So non-sponsor plug, but they are pretty fun. I've got one back here. I used to shoot my buddies with too. Uh, we'll go to the questions here. Just killing time waiting on Lou. Let's be honest. Uh, that bloke at interview is pure entertainment. Got lots of that little, mostly positive feedback coming back on that. Uh, Randy's been bullying a lot of people for a long time. So sometimes you got to stand up to that. And in the fishing world, there's not a whole lot of, whole lot of conflict or, uh, uh, confrontation, I should say. Uh, and you know, I don't love confrontation myself, but if someone's saying things like that and, and going off for, for that long about it, it's, uh, sometimes you got to face the bully. Do you think Dustin Buff will do more tourneys in the USA? Yep. He was, he was asking, uh, a, a few questions about the open. So I don't, he asked a couple questions last year too. And actually Brian Bickle's doing the Northerns right now. Um, I don't even know what team he played for probably Chicago. I'm not a hot, like I'm not, I like hockey, but I'm not a hockey nerd, but he came up to me at Watts bar and, uh, we've had a couple, couple conversations. He's a beauty and it'd be good to have buff there too. A couple NHLers, um, Kyle Patrick, what place do you think is completely out of it in the opens? Congratulations to Kyle Patrick, by the way, I forgot to mention that here. I, I said it on the open show that he was on, but, uh, he's a buddy. He's, uh, we've got kind of a crew of misfits down there. Uh, Lou's in it now too. I see him in the comments, but Brad, me, Raz, Kyle, we all talk, you know, through practice and everything and, and we're all totally different and, <laughs> and, uh, Kyle's, uh, Kyle's wired up and he's always teasing it. I actually only beat him in one tournament this year. Um, you know, it, if you look at some of the top dogs, I can be like, okay, I beat that guy twice. And it's just like, makes you feel a little bit better, even though they're they're whipping my ass in points, but Kyle, the only time I beat him is when he slipped up at the St. Lawrence. Otherwise he's been tanning my ass all year and he finally got a win out of it, which is no surprise at all. He's guaranteed freaking out about points right now. He's in six overall. He's going to be going to the show. I don't have a doubt in my mind, but he'll never say that, but yeah, he's, he's going to catch him. What place he thinks completely out of it. I think Raz, uh, Adam Rasmussen, her buddy from Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin is in, uh, uh, 19th and Keith Toom is in 20th. Um, I mean, it's Florida. Anything can happen. Uh, I think Raz still has an outside chance at making it. I, I like to think that Tuma does too. He's such a beauty and he, uh, 
he had a nuke at the last one, his first real bomb of the season. So I'd uh, I'd still give it to the top 20 just after last week. Like I was in 20th and moved up to 10th and Tyler Williams was in 17th and moved up to 9th. Like you can make that kind of charge. So let's uh, let's get Lou in here. What's up, Louie? What's up, buddy? I told you not to leave me hanging, man. I'm just talking to myself in the corner of the garage. I need a guest here. I know, but you're you're everybody's hero. They want to hear from you more than I. Uh-uh. I got a clip here. I got a clip. For <laughs> I know you. where this is going. <laughs> okay, listen. Hey, guys, this, I'm telling you right off the bat, Louis Minetti is my hero. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's Uncle Randy. Me. That's right. <laughs> oh, Lou, I had it out with Uncle Randy the other day. Oh, uh, did you? Yeah. Well, I'm just... Unfortunately- you know, just difference of opinions. That's all. I, I haven't gotten around to listening to it yet, but I'm very excited too. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's pretty good that two guys with totally differing opinions both uh, both are really fond of you. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'll take it however I can get. It. <laughs> um, well, yeah. yeah. Well, we've had you on get the nap or on uh, into the great wide opens before, but this is uh, it's a bit more northern of a crew here. So I, I kind of introduced you earlier, but this is Lou Minetti, college bracket champion, most affectionately known for his college bracket win in a 1996 17 foot Ranger with a 115 Mercury rolling coal Dang seats right. shredded, no grass. Guys, the wheel. I miss her, man. I miss her. No, thanks for having me on, buddy. I'm I'm uh, excited for the Northern Crew, and I mean, shoot, I'm I'm kind of jealous of the Northern Crew. I think I was telling you, uh, Razbout can convince me to move up there in, in my future. We'll see if it ends up happening, but I, I yeah, can't say we got it's you not. sold on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, what was like? Lou stayed with us at the last two derbies. Uh, you know, for a little backstory here, uh, you had some other buddies you were staying with the rest of the year. Yep. Just yep. That's your big podcast answer. You're not going to get yep. in any story. Just okay. Yep. No, yep. G- <laughs> Gus, you got me distracted with his comment. That is uh, the answer is absolutely yes to, and that's that's all. Uh, <laughs> I won't dive further into it, but the answer is absolutely yes, Gussie. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Gussie. That's why we fired up this podcast, and that's why I got last year's classic. <laughs> Quit grilling our damn gears here. I was waiting for Lou to talk about it. Uh, let's get right into it, Lou. Eastern Fothergill uh, met this young man and his dad at Sturgeon Bay Open last year. They both came over, said they're fans of Get the Net, Lou. Northern boys. I don't, actually don't know where they're from, but I think it's somewhere right. in the north. Uh, I'm pretty sure Minnesota. Minnesota, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, both super nice guys. They were actually leading the Sturgeon Bay Open, or they were way up there when they came up to me. It was might have been their first time there. Um, and in a wild turn of events, Easton, this, I mean, this is the craziest Cinderella story ever. I mean, this happens all the time. You had a Cinderella story last year too, but he, uh, he had just had brain surgery really not long ago at all. Um, and it entered this, he, he had qualified for this college bracket and now is head to head with, uh, Tucker Smith, who's one of the kids, him and Logan Parks won the million dollar Bass Pro Shops, Mega Bowl, Flint Tropics, whatever it was called last year, uh, <laughs> super tournament. And uh, this is kind of like David versus Goliath here. And Tucker Smith's been around the Opens. Um, you know, we're uh, we're not going to sugarcoat it. He was actually disqualified from the first Open of the year, one of the days for, uh, for sportsmanship and fraction. Um, he's been around. He's been winning tourneys forever. Everyone knows he's going to the top. You can obviously catch him. But Mr. Fothergill's having something to say about that, Lou. You've been following? Uh, slightly. I, I watched a good bit. I actually worked pretty much by myself all day uh, yesterday and spent my whole day at work just watching live. Um, and so I watched a bunch of it that first day. I didn't watch any of it today. I was fishing a club derb. But, I mean, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. It's David versus Goliath. It's uh, how do you not root for this guy who's just coming out of – yeah, pretty traumatic experience to say the least. And I mean, it's God, it's going to be interesting to watch tomorrow. Um, it, I always find it interesting, especially, you know, even myself, like I won that tournament last year and the final days on a Monday, which kind of has just got a weird vibe to it as a whole anyways. But yeah. I think, uh, I think a lot of people will probably be sitting at work, you know, I think it, it drives up viewership. So 
whatever goes down tomorrow, a lot of people will see it. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, there's no, there's no denying either of their abilities. You know, Tucker, like you said, has won everything under the sun. Obviously, a little bit of, uh, um, I don't know what what the wordage would be as to conduct unbecoming a proper Basson man. I. I I, I like that. <laughs> uh, there's there's some conduct unbecoming of proper Basson men going on there. Um, and Easton, as far as I know, you know, I haven't heard a bad thing about the guy. Um, not to say that, that you know, that I, 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 as far as my conversations and stuff with Tucker in the past, he seems like a fine kid. Um, yeah. I have no, you know, personal qualms with him by any means. Um, and like I said, they're both extremely talented anglers. I mean, Tucker's winning the, everything under the sun. Like you said, Eastern's Easton's gone up and, you know, won or come close to winning what you guys have told me is the hardest tournament to win in the world. Um, That's just and, what Raz said because he hasn't won it yet. <laughs> true. <laughs> um, it is tough to win. Obviously. And uh, he, I mean, he won team of the year this year. And uh, that that's a title that, Myself and my partner Michael were lucky enough to win last year, and that I think only gets harder as the years go on. Um, you know, college fishing is, I have plenty of words for college fishing that aren't positive, but one thing that is positive is the participation is through the roof. Um, it becomes harder and harder every year to go out there and compete, and more and more guys want to fish all four. And so it, uh, it's it's tough to do what those guys did this year. And there's there's no denying that he's a fantastic angler. Both of them are. Yeah. Well, Lou, I'll be honest. I didn't give a rat's ass about college fishing until I saw you in the <laughs> in the old range because it looked a lot like my '97 champion. I had nicer seats though. They're still ripped and duct taped, but yours are like ravaged. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're um, in a tough spot. <laughs> and it it got a lot of eyes on it. And then you know to see in the opens this year. Uh, tell the viewers. What happens if you win this tournament? Yeah, so the either Easton or Tucker tomorrow, um, they will gain entry automatically. Which, for me, I mean, I'll I'll get into it, but I think that this is potentially the biggest part of it, outside of obviously the classic. Um, you get entry into all nine opens, um, which with the EQs and how things are structured today, um, and how much everything costs, God. It's uh, that's just a massive value right there in and of itself. Um, so entry in all nine opens, uh, Bassmaster Classic berth, which I mean, you know, if that was the only thing that came of it, I don't think anybody would be upset. Um, yep. And the use of a brand new Nitro and Tundra for the year, as well as, you know, a uh, whole slew of perks and, you know, sponsorship stuff of the, of the program, you know, lose striking supports the program tremendously, which is phenomenal. Um, and they've outfitted myself and the past winners with some awesome gear. Um, and I hope they continue to, because, you know, it's, it's really cool to kind of get your foot in the door in the industry that way. Um, but it's just kind of the whole package. It's basically a one year ticket to go and try and make it as a pro. Right. But it's so it's the entry. That's uh, what would that be around? I think it's 17,200. 17, yeah. And then the boat and the truck for, for, a, a, year. for a college kid. Um, and then you're like, you didn't have a, a pile of coin or anything squirreled up away for this. Hey, it's and if you win it, you, you don't have a real choice. Like, you, you're going, yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, it's kind of been uh, you know, as my, my bank account is dwindled towards the end of the year, it's like, man, I keep going to these dang things. But I, it, it's in hindsight and, and looking at myself, you know, a couple months ago thinking that way, it's kind of a really crappy way to look at it. And so, um, no, it's it's a pretty sweet deal, honestly. And yeah. It's, it's, it's a one-way ticket, you know, to take a shot for a year. It's, it's incredible. Um, and- I mean, Especially, no one expects you to make it in your first year either. So it's like, no. it's a, for you, it's going to like, I mean, pretty much what it did for you is give you a sample of the crack. Well, dude, that's <laughs> well the, exactly the Bassmaster Classic more than anything, probably. Yeah. I mean, for me, that, that is, that was and is everything. You know, I, it, it's weird going into last year or going into this year. I was so gung ho on the, the opens and, and so like in, 
vested in trying to make it like, man, this is my one shot. I got to make everything of it. And looking back on it, you know, I'm uh, in a week and a half, it'll be over for me. Um, God, that the, the classic is everything. You know, even if I was having a kick ass here in the opens and, you know, flirting with making the elites, it doesn't hold a candle to what the classic is. You can, you can take a shot at, you know, making the elite series, however many times you want to um and make it and you kind of know what that entails yeah the blue trophy is cool and the, I, I obviously that is my life goal is to get there but that classic is it man that it's that's really it I, there's not there's not enough i can say and the other cool thing i wanted to kind of note is just the fact that you know i don't know that easton or tucker are in this position but um the tournament is cool the bracket is cool in and of itself because of the way that it, it affords me someone like me the opportunity that i got now how many me's are left i have no idea not many i don't think let's run that down lou that's uh lou is an anti-live scoper as much as anyone i've ever met including randy um (laughs) is that is that what you mean by me like is that no (laughs) no you got there's more no, I mean just you know, broke kids who don't have a freaking hundred thousand dollar rig who aren't jumping in the college series with a boat that's ready to go on the elite series, and who also don't live scope. But yes, <laughs> yes and no. Right, and it, Randy and I had this conversation on uh, into the great wide opens, and um, yeah, he he outright just came and said it's. I mean, it's damn near impossible uh, to do it, but. You know, I, I countered with 10, 10 names or eight names that had recently done it. And those are the guys everyone relates to. You know, right. that's that's why you blew up so much when you won that tournament. If if it was right. Luminetti with, a, you know, a visor on and a 20-foot a boat with all the new tech and everything and just doing the same old talking to the camera about exactly what you're doing, then you'd just be the uh, another guy that won the college bracket and yeah you know it's just so having that background kind of i mean it gave you a name for you know for what that's worth which i think is is more than you might be giving it credit for in the industry definitely no that that is that's kind of a a part of the winning that tournament that isn't um isn't like broadcasted or or advertised i should say it's just that, you know, you, you get you really the biggest thing that comes out of it, if you want to do this for a career, um, is you get your foot in the door in every way possible. I mean, the people you meet just through, throughout the year, the people that I've met uh, at the Classic or through the Opens or you name it, um, it's been it's been phenomenal. Just that in and of itself. Um, and sure, there's other ways to do that. Um, but to have that as kind of like an added perk on top of just, you know, the, the physical and the actual things that you win, like the boat and the truck and all that stuff, it's, I feel like, like you said, it's, that's kind of the unspoken thing that you gain access to that. If you want to make a career in this helps out big time. Yeah. And you're a young guy. Like how old are you? 23, 24 in a week. Okay. So we just learned today that 34 is the threshold for that's as old as you can be. To what? <laughs> well, they they broke it down on live last weekend, and I, they said I was the single oldest person in the in the 10 cut. Are you really? Like for for the opens, not for the single tournament because there are a couple locals. Um, I guess I didn't think about that. Yeah, Kent is older than me, but he. Uh, I don't know. Maybe he's 22 years old. He smokes and drinks so many Red Bulls. (laughs) Who knows? He's an absolute beauty, but he's already in. So they took him out of the list, but yeah, it went me. And then the next oldest was, uh, was our buddy Kyle. What? He's he's like, he's like 26, 27. And then after that, it's, uh, I think Garrett's like 25 or 26, but Trey McKinney's 18, JT's 21, Tyler Williams, 21. My window's shrinking. Well, that's a pretty good length of time. I'm not saying it can't be done, but I was like, holy shit, when did I become the old guy? Yeah, you're the like, outlier. What the hell? Yeah, just like that, that. That feels weird. Yeah, 
Keith that Tuma was really like weird. doing the boys proud, like he's in his forties. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's uh Kyle just said are, are you joking? I'm the second oldest. Yeah, bud. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kind of what hit me the hardest is is not so much that you're the oldest at 34 that Kyle's the second oldest at 26. <laughs> like that just feels wrong. <laughs> that is bizarre, man. I didn't think about that. I I guess it's getting younger. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's. I think I'm, I'm gonna say, geez, I really I'm gonna sound like Randy Black. This is gonna go be ahead, fun. man. Like I, I um, said before, you came on that I agree with a lot of the things Randy says is batshit crazy as they may sound yeah i mean i feel like this isn't hard to this isn't like a real disputable thing i feel like maybe it, it simply is something to do with the fact that the forward-facing sonar is as dominant as it is mm-hmm. and the younger generation is just so much more familiar with technology kind of like you know the classic example of you know the grandson having to turn on grandpa's tv or turn off his tv it's it's the same kind of thing it's we're so much not we because not i'm obviously not one of them yeah but, you're benjamin button yeah <laughs> <laughs> the rest the rest of normal 23 to 26 year old it's so normal to look at a screen and understand what's going on and figure all that out um which could be why that you know there's I feel like been a youth movement, but more so these obviously this year, but um, these last couple of years, it's even going towards it more. Yeah. I don't, I might be out of turn in saying this, but I think everyone in the top 10 right now, except for me and Kyle have been involved in college fishing mm. or high school. It's Robert G, John Garrett, JT never did. He didn't college fish. No, no but I think he's the only one out. Robert hmm. G did. He had a cool story. Like I, uh, I watched him on live and you know, he said, uh, he's kind of like a Benjamin button too. He's got the big beard. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> he's like one of the old boys that's 24 or whatever, but he said they didn't have like, he's like, we didn't have a coach that went and got info for us. Nothing like that. They just kind of yeah. showed up, splashed the boat and went for it, which was pretty His, badass. I thought their club there at Tennessee is the same as ours in Charlotte. Like, even though it's a big name school, it's the same. It's ran the same way. There's no coach. It's student ran. It's pretty bare bones, which I always have a little more respect for the guys that come from it's, it's weird. There's like this kind of, unknown to most of the fishing world i would assume yourself that there's like this weird it's like an unspoken battle between club college teams and team college teams you have your like bethels and montevallos and mckendries and adrians and all those schools while you know i don't it's not like there's anything bad to say it's just kind of a like a unspoken rivalry that's always going to be there for right. schools like us, like Tennessee, Charlotte, whatever, you're kind of always like gunning for the guys that have a coach and have funds and all that and all the nice boats and the wraps and like those are the targets. That's the unfair like aspect of college fishing. And so, yeah, I always I didn't know that. Well, I guess I technically did know that about uh, Robert, but I didn't really think about it that, yeah, he's kind of like. Like I see him as one of us kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to draw a line there or divide. Cause I, I honestly, like when I first showed up at the opens, I was like, Oh my God, I hate these guys. <laughs> like, <laughs> ripping around on dad's credit card, like, you know, in trucks, nicer than mine that I've had to save my whole life for. And I'm just like, Gah! but after I meet like almost all of them I've met yeah. and, and I like them, you know, it's yeah. not, but it's just that, it's that initial thing, even without meeting someone, they already get the judgment. And that's, that's really what Randy was leaning on, uh, you know, the, to kind of line up our, our bit of a conflict there. But yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you're, you're definitely one of our favorite pickups. What was it like staying with the old boys, the old Northern boys uh, for the last couple derbies, like different dynamic or what, what let's hear it. I haven't it asked was... your take on this yet. <laughs> it was awesome um i i can't tell you guys how much i freaking appreciate you guys taking me in just because i i think upon reflecting on you know the last two tournaments were my two best of the year 
Um, yeah, I'm you got 39th of... at the toughest tournament on the schedule. Watts Bar, that's yeah. a check. No graph, no scope, literally no front graph. He's Nothing. got his front graph cables. This boat's beautifully outfitted. And he's got duct tape around his front graph cables, leaves the front graphs in the truck. Like no waypoints, nothing. Oh, natural. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's 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 gotten to the point in the year where I'm like, you know what? I'm not gonna learn. I'm just gonna go freaking balls to the wall and fish my ass off and see what happens. And I seriously, like I said, it was my two best tournaments of the year. I think you guys helped me out tremendously. Um, and upon reflecting on it, I think what it was is like you said, you got to the opens and it was screw these guys and you know you kind of see some of the stuff that goes on and it's, screw that like it's info it's like, yeah info, yeah the um, whole unlimited pre-practice everything like that you name it the whole lot of it and it just makes you want to just hate it um and i did and i have all year and it's it's been um something i've definitely struggled with and it's made this year harder for me is you know not on top of struggling i almost have this like Oh, like I have to break my moral code to do well in this sport. And I don't, I don't have it in me to do that at all. Um, and so I, I kind of had that internal battle with myself all year. And then I think a big part of staying with y'all that helped me is that I stayed with y'all. And it's one thing, you know, I, I knew you guys were good guys just talking and passing and being on the pod and all that stuff. But I know you know you. Um, and staying with you guys for two weeks, I feel like I got to know y'all on that. We hate the same things. <laughs> like we, the, all the things that disgust me about the opens disgust you guys. The only difference is, is you guys brush it off and still go catch the rats. I'm sitting here going, "Oh, pity me!" Like, screw that. Um, and so <laughs> I think, if anything, I've kind of you guys helped me just make like slap myself in the face and be like, "Stop worrying about that shit, man!" And just fish the way you know how to fish, like. I went and kicked ass against worse odds before. Like, I can do it again. These guys are doing it. They're not breaking any moral codes. Like, they're doing it the right way, the way we all were, or at least some of us, were brought up doing it. And so I think that was kind of the biggest benefit and the, the best thing I took out of hanging with you guys, just on top of having a freaking ball and laughing at the silly shit Brad says. <laughs> yeah. yeah you came in. we haven't had the tv on all year because we got brad like he's gonna <laughs> he's gonna entertain you all night he's the absolute best guy so funny and lou yeah. is like playing with the wires and turns the damn tv on i was like what are you what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> you <have> kids <laughs> i shouldn't be anywhere near a tv <laughs> what was it yeah. like lou uh so at Ozarks, we went for lunch one day um, <laughs> with uh, with our crew, and then Matt Robertson on him fishing joined us. And uh, you mean Kyle's best friend? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, everyone was meeting for the first time. Uh, <laughs> so Matt was like, you know, he looks at it like we do. Like, you know, he he grinded there from the bottom up and never went through the college channels or anything like that and was like not about to go for lunch with the college angler and then when he when he recognized lou and was like oh <laughs> you're the guy at the old boat you're in yeah, yeah. that was uh that was funny the, the where it actually came out was uh me, brad matt and myself all slept in the first day of practice and uh, <laughs> Matt goes out the front door and sees the Charlotte University of Charlotte boat sitting out there. And he he turns around and goes, "You, I'll not go completely into details, but like he, he just trashed me. He's like, no wonder I want to stay here because he was leaving. He's like, oh, I ain't staying so loud. Yeah, I ain't staying with no damn college kid. And he leaves. And I was like, hmm, I'm sitting here eating my breakfast. What? <laughs> okay. Uh, and then about 30 seconds later, he walks back and he goes, wait a minute, you're the one with the piece of shit ranger. I was like, yeah. <laughs> he said, never mind, I like you. <laughs> oh, what a beauty. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, see, people recognize you from, from breaking the mold. Yeah. I'm pulling for you, Lou. That's why, like, oh, man, I, I want you to do it the John Cox way, but I fear for you, bud, for – the live scope thing like it's uh you know it's 
without it, you're there's just even more disparity. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to like, where's your, and don't let me sway. I already tried long no. enough and I took you out live scoping, but, um, you know, and I'm not saying it's my favorite tool either. I, I wish it didn't exist because mm-hmm. if it didn't exist, then you wouldn't have to put it on your boat every year and, and have to rely on it to compete, which you do. I don't, you know, no matter what any, anyone says for the, if you want to compete at a consistent level, unless you're John Cox or, or Lou, it's, uh, you know, that number is really shrinking by the year. Uh, well, and, and the, I think the other thing is too, um, you can survive. I'm convinced, um, by guys like John Cox and maybe even throw out a, I don't know if I want to say Poche because I think he's he uses it at least. Oh um, yeah, and he uses it hard, and he has a very unique situation with his boat. Um, so he's an outlier, but I, th- I think there's a couple guys on the elite series on the top level tours who are pretty committed to doing it the old fashioned way. Um, I mean, it, I think it's it's possible, very possible, to survive at the top level once you get there. Without. Yes, I think that's the that's the, the discussion caveat. we had. <laughs> Once you get there, um, and so I, I definitely am aware that before you know everything I talked with you about, um, you know, obviously no, no one watching knows what we talked about, but um, just talking about, look, I, I need to learn this. And I'm aware of it, and I hate it. I really do. Um, but it's time to learn it. And so I jumped in the boat, you, and I really appreciate your lessons and I hope to get a couple more in the future. But, uh, I, I know that I do have to learn it at some point and it, the, the time's going to be next year or the next two years before I take another crack at it. Um, and once you get there, you can put her back in the truck, Louie. Yeah, like, exactly. The, the elites is totally different. The competition level, everyone there is, is qualified to be there. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's a hundred boat field. So all these lakes, this has been my experience. All these lakes we go to, when you go up shallow for the first day, day and a half, it's good. It's fishing. Great. You can yeah. take a swim jig, a spinner bait, a frog and mm-hmm. go flipping, run the bank and catch fish. Well, there's two things that happen. My, and I, I'm included in these, uh, opens guys stick them a lot more than elite guys, period. That's mm-hmm. that, you know inexperience lack of knowledge about the lake uh four and a half days of of stick and fish shallow Mm -hmm. and they're just and then four and a half days of practice versus two and a half days with a field uh 125 percent size size. yeah um you know at at the beginning of the year when there's 225 boats so it's It's uh it's different. It's a different world. It's a different game. And I've said it on podcasts before too, that the, you know, the opens kind of turns guys into professional drop shotters until they get there for a lot of it. Um, it you know, I, I know like John Garrett's caught probably 70 or 80% of his fish this year on a drop shot. I mean, he's good enough. He can do everything, um, yeah. but it's a totally different game. So I think once you get past it, you can go to the elites and, and see that, you know, pick up that swim jig again and, yeah, and have some fun there. But, I mean, the bank in the opens just dissipates. Like, it just it's, goes to no man's land. I've seen so many bites go away in, in the last eight tournaments. It's been unbelievable just how many things have just disappeared. How many times my buddy who I was staying with um, the first couple tournaments of the year, um, how many times we – it got to the point, I want to say it was Wheeler. Unfortunately, I was dog-tired and sick. Um, and I didn't practice the first like three days at Wheeler, but he put in and he called me at like two o'clock in the afternoon and he said, it's happening again. Is it day one of practice? He said, it's happening again. So what do you mean? He said, I'm freaking cracking. Up. I was like, oh, like it got to the point where on day one and two of practice, when we started cracking their ass, it was, it made you feel sick because you knew it was going to be gone. You just knew. And it was like, just made you feel like crap. I mean, God, it's it's so tough. Um, but uh, to kind of in a way change the subject, um, I know I got to learn it, and I also know at, at the core of my heart, as much as it hurts to say, um, you know, I'm I'm an ultra competitive person, even though I 
try to not come off as that kind of a, a dick about it. Um, and I want like the end goal is not just to make it. The end goal is to say, screw Kevin Van Dam. I want to be the best ever. Like I'm, I don't want to, if you shoot for less than that, I feel like you're screwed. Um, right. And so that's how, that's how I look at it. And my unfortunate coming to reality is that, yeah, I can get, to, even if I get to the elite series with it and put it away, like, that'd be great. Like, yeah, I could be John Cox, win a couple tournaments a year, maybe have an awesome year in top five in AOI, but you're yeah. never going to be Kevin Van Dam like that. Um, so not only do you have to learn it to get there, but if you want to be the best in the world, you got to learn it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh the unfortunate reality i mean i like to randy out a little bit like when spot lock came along on the uh on the all tracks i was mm -hmm. like i was mortified because like i'd spent so much time learning proper boat control and ha you know had that muscle memory of how to stand on a surfboard in the middle of nowhere in a 17 foot boat with an old four tracks <laughs> and then the spot lock came along and now you know, now any kid with a jig and a minnow can just hit spot lock and that whole skill set is gone. Yeah. Um, you know, the same thing with triangulating the bank. Like when I go out fishing with Gussie, he's got because you know, he's been tournament fishing forever. A lot of the really good guys around here are like in that 37 to 42 year age kind of thing. Yeah. And then there's some really good guys that are like in their fifties. Um and then you know there's a gap again but when you go out like a guy named brian mcdanny he's a guy he's a guide up here and, and gussie like they don't even look at their graphs for navigating unless they absolutely have to gussie runs his graph on north up <laughs> so do how I. old school is that okay so yeah <laughs> yeah two peas in a pod and that were like <laughs> you know what before that came out like they're these guys are experts at triangulating the bank like you are and it's that whole skill set just kind of I mean, it's still there and they still use it, but it's uh, the amount of time and and effort they put into learning that is just kind of, um, you know, it becomes redundant. And that's, yeah. I think that's why when the live scope came out, like I would way rather it just be 2D, especially mm -hmm. like when we go somewhere, you know, like Cherokee Lake last year, mm -hmm. I would love to have just had a 2D or a flasher there um, mm -hmm. just because it's so similar to how we fish at home. But it's one of those things where you kind of have to ask yourself, do you hate technology more than you love competing? Right. I don't no, put that on a t-shirt for Randy. That's, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the honest, that's, that's it right there. I mean, and I, I do, I hate it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. You're, I know. I can't what? believe you, you even, oh, sorry. Oh boy. I can't believe you even hopped into London, like entertained looking at it for a day i mean yeah i, I you, it's tough man it, it's it's tough for me to get past it but um you know like i said there's there's moral lines that i will not cross um to get where i want to get in the sport simply and if that costs me being the best ever so be it i can live with it but when it comes to something like technology at some point i gotta get over my ego and my you know self-righteousness about it and learn it at the very least i do think i will say i maybe i'm freaking crazy for this you can possibly tell me or maybe you can say yeah 20 percent. you're right um, i do think there's a world where you can get to be in that like really high upper echelon especially as time goes on um and fish get more and more used to it you know they adapt which they will and they already are as you've told me and other guys have told me um I think there's a, a place for the guy who can be a kind of old fashioned first. And when you know you need it, lean on it kind of guy to be in that upper echelon of the sport. I think that's there. What do you think? I, I think you can't just be a straight live scoper and you can't just be a straight dock skipper or any like right. i think you need that full package and yeah i don't think you get that if you're just born on the scope which none of these guys competing in the opens are they can all mm -hmm. they can all fish like there's all the all the guys in the top 
20 top 30 like you don't get there just by straight scoping like right. as, as much as everyone wants to believe but i think it's a, a it's a combination of skills and i mean yeah. i do think that you know a guy like you when you do learn it you already have that skill set that doesn't go anywhere right you know so like like for example if you took a john cox and for you know i don't know 10 percent of the time he was you know a really good live scope he knew he could be a really good live scope fisherman and that's something that i need to be to can be on the opens obviously but if you took a guy and i'm not near as good as john cox is on the bank trust me but uh if you took that guy and added in 10% of the time being a really competent live scope user, does he become a perennial top five AOI guy? He's already a perennial like top 10, top 15, but does he become like a, like a force force? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we'll see. I mean, the other argument to that is if he was distracted, even that 10%, he might not be as dominant as he is. So we can talk this till we're blue. That's the the game. Yeah. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be interesting watching this college bracket tomorrow. Uh, I think it's on FS one. Most of the people listening are probably Canadian bassmaster.com. They'll they'll stream the whole thing all day with Ronnie and Such and Jake Whitaker, I think are on there. It's uh, it's going to be good to watch. You're (laughs) going to hop on. They might have me Skype in. I'm not sure. We'll oh, see. that'd be awesome. I hope so. If you do, tell him all the boys uh, in the north are pulling for him as if he doesn't already know that. But um, I will. huge, uh, huge shout out to Easton Father Gill, and hopefully he gets her done. But yeah. thanks, uh, thanks for hopping so. on, bud. You're uh, you're a legend. To a lot of the folks up here keep uh, keep the Ranger videos coming. You're gonna have to break some more stuff on that for your highlight videos because I think you've done about eight. <laughs> I will. I, I'll say help. this. I will. I have. I'm, I'm. I think I got one more that's definitely coming out, and then next year, shoot, I'll be back in her. But uh, I hope. But my goal right now is to someday pull up to not Sturgeon because I'll die, but Sturgeon, pull up to KBI in the range. That would be like that's like a life goal of mine. So that's a yep. that's a plan I have. Hey, Brian Gustis and I had my 97 through the through the top 10 boat parade when we were young. So it's Hell uh, yeah. it's achievable. But uh, thanks again, bud. What's your uh, your Instagram's Lewis underscore Minetti? Yeah, that's it. Simple. Yeah. Okay. No one will forget your name because it sounds like a Luminetti, but um, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> check them out. Uh, thanks for coming on, bud, and tune well, in to Bassmaster.com tomorrow. I appreciate it. Hopefully I'll be on there. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you having me on. Hope All right, talk bud. To we'll see you in a week. <laughs> yeah, man. We'll see you at the Harris chain. Safe travels. See you, buddy. Thanks. Bye. All right. Hope you guys uh, enjoyed that first, first live deal. Not really sure how that's going to shake out, but like I said, time's limited. So I don't have time to throw in the fancy intro and all that. And just wanted to have my buddy on and have a chat. Um, he's, uh, he's hell bent on fishing KBI next year or Ford or one of the derbies. Like, I shared a couple Instagram reels of, you know, some tournaments around here and it, it, it doesn't look like that down South. It does at the Bassmaster classic, but the top 10 boat parade, the fans, the quality of fishing, like almost everybody gets a limit in every tournament that just doesn't exist down there. So it's, uh, it's turning a lot of heads and, uh, pretty cool. It'd be cool to see Lou and Lou and a couple of the other boys from the South show up and hopping a couple of derbs up here. So thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, if you haven't subscribed already do that, please. And, uh, we will keep you updated from the Harris chain. Have a good night.